Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, co-director with Frank Goodyear of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. It is my pleasure to welcome you to a timely discussion about the preservation of cultural heritage in Iraq with two leading experts, Jessica Johnson, head of conservation at the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute, and Corinne Wegner, director of the Smithsonian's Culture Rescue Initiative. This evening's discussion is made possible by the Yadgar Family Endowment, dedicated to the preservation, interpretation, and dissemination of information about the Assyrian reliefs at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. We are enormously grateful for the important ways in which this endowment has spurred increased attention to and research about Bowdoin's reliefs in the recent past. And tonight, I wish to express our profound appreciation to Michael Yadgar, who joins us. Thank you, Michael. Tonight's presentation takes place against the backdrop of Assyria to America, an exhibition co-curated by Sean Burris, the museum's Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellow, and Jim Higginbotham, associate professor of classics on the Henry Johnson Professorship Fund and curator for the ancient collections at the BCMA. The show places the museum's 3,000-year-old Assyrian reliefs in the context of other examples of visual culture from the period for the first time in the relief's 150-year history at Bowdoin College. The exhibition also contextualizes the collecting of these objects, including an 1859 letter from Bowdoin alumnus Henry Byron Haskell, a member of Bowdoin's medical school class of 1855, offering these reliefs to his alma mater. Also on view are works by the contemporary artist Michael Rakowitz, a Chicago-based artist of Iraqi descent, which reflect upon the new layers of meaning accrued by ancient, these ancient works for audiences today. This combination of discussing a Bowdoin alumnus and a contemporary artist automatically brings to mind the important be work being done by today's students at Bowdoin. And on that note, I also want to acknowledge the many important contributions made to Assyria from, a, to Assyri from Assyria to America by Bowdoin Jr. and museum intern Brooke Rubel. This evening, we have an opportunity to learn more about yet another important context for understanding Bowdoin's Assyrian reliefs, their relationship to the ancient site of Nimrud, capital of the Assyrian Empire, and the home of the Northwest Palace of King Ashurnasirpal II, from which Bowdoin's reliefs derive. As we will hear, Jessica Johnson and Corinne Wagner have done groundbreaking work in addressing the preservation of cultural heritage in the region, particularly in the wake of political unrest and military campaigns that have unfolded during the past two decades. Jessica Johnson is the head of conservation and senior objects conservator at the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute specializing in archaeological materials and ethnographic objects. Jesse helped to establish the Iraqi Institute for, Conserva for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage, where she held leadership roles from 2009 to 2014. From 2000 to 2009, she served as senior conservator at the National Museum of the American Indian. In addition to her current work in Iraq, Jessie has, has extensive experience in field conservation, working with archaeologists in Turkey, Iraq, Syria, and Cyprus. 
She is currently an honorary research associate at the Institute of Archaeology, University College, London. Corinne Wagner is the director of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, SCRI, an outreach program dedicated to the preservation of cultural heritage in crisis situations in the U.S. and abroad. SCRI's work includes projects in Syria, Iraq, Haiti, Nepal, and around the world. SCRI also co-chairs with FEMA's Office of Environmental and Historic Preservation, the Heritage Emergency National Task Force, part of the U.S. National Disaster Recovery Framework. Wagner's connection to the Smithsonian began with the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, where she served as an international, as the international project coordinator for the preservation of more than 30,000 objects of Haitian heritage after the devastating 2010 earthquake. Before her arrival at the Smithsonian, Wagner was an associate curator in the Department of Decorative Arts, Textiles and Sculpture at the, Mini at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. In her concurrent career as a U.S. Army Reserve Officer, she served on military deployments, including as an Arts, Monuments, and Archives Officer assigned to assist after the 2003 looting of the Iraq National Museum. In 2006, Corrine founded the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, part of an international organization dedicated to raising awareness of the 1954 Hague Convention for the protection of cultural property in the event of an armed conflict. This evening, Corrine Wagner will speak first, followed immediately by Jesse Johnson. After the two of them have concluded their remarks, I'm delighted to say that Sean Burris has agreed to lead a conversation with them with the audience. We look forward to hearing from you at that time. And now, please join me in welcoming Jesse Johnson and Corrine Wagner for their presentation, Recovering Nimrud, the Smithsonian's Project in Iraq. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Anne for the very nice introduction and, and also Frank and Sean for inviting us here this evening and um, such a warm welcome we have had here at Gordon and spending time with students today has been phenomenal. And so thanks to everyone who made our visit here possible tonight. Um, so you might wonder why you have a picture from uh, Nepal on your screen, but that's because um, I want to explain a little bit about the Cultural Rescue Initiative and why the Smithsonian is doing this. And I'll talk just briefly about one project that we have in Iraq, and then I'm going to invite Jesse up to talk more broadly about the Smithsonian's work in Iraq. So I was a mild-mannered curator um, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, where I want to acknowledge um, Christopher Monkhouse, who's here in the audience tonight, who was my mentor and my boss for many years in the decorative arts department. And it was a lovely place to work, but um, I got, I had a higher calling as well. And as an army officer for a long time um, and going to Iraq in 2003 after the devastating looting and working with the staff there, I realized that while there might be a lot of people who can effectively build great collections and exhibitions at art museums around the world, there were maybe not so many people who could speak militarese and try to get across the importance of protecting cultural heritage. So I decided to devote the rest of my career to doing that, although I do still like the occasional curating of things when I can get, get it. Um, so the Smithsonian, um, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with it, but um, founded with funding and through the will of, of British citizen and scientist James Smithson for the increase in diffusion of knowledge. Uh, clear back in 1846, we're, we're quasi-governmental, we're part government, part private foundation, and it's the world's largest museum education and research complex. 
we have a lot of staff and a lot of museums. I won't bore you too much with that, but 19 museums, nine research centers, the National Zoo, and in that one tiny component of that is this idea that we work beyond the walls of the Smithsonian with the Cultural Rescue Initiative. And um, that started with the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project back in 2010. I was still working at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, um, but working with this organization called the Blue Shield for protection of cultural heritage in armed conflict, but also in disasters. And uh, we had some outreach asking how we could help with the museums in Haiti after the terrible earthquake. And I met Dr. Richard Kieran, my current boss, who was undersecretary for history, art, and culture at the time. And he said, gosh, we gotta do something. We're, we're getting calls for, and I think Richard came and spoke here um, not, too, not in the too distant past. And he really brought the resources and expertise of the Smithsonian to bear. And in addition, brought together lots of other partners like the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, and so many others who helped with that recovery. And so we were able to, based on that experience, realized that there really was a gap and need for this kind of work. And we created the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. And we work in places all across the world, um, including in the United States after disasters. Um, and these are sort of our areas. We, we're trying all the time to raise awareness, to do deliver training so that um, museums and cultural professionals can become more resilient and understand how to prevent damage to their collections and disasters. Um, then re, um, actual disaster response, which we hope won't happen as often, but it still happens too, mu too much. And the research, understanding the root causes and how we can do better. And so this, these are just a few examples. This is our colleague, my and Jesse's colleague, Dr. Catherine Hansen, who's an archeologist. We got asked to do an exhibition for Congress, for members of Congress on understanding the damage that ISIS was doing to cultural heritage. So um, we have a lot of events at the Smithsonian. Here's an example of response. This is a, a, an actual mission that we did in Nepal a few years ago after the big earthquake there and trying to help train colleagues, but also we train the military on how to do that disaster response and how to prevent damage to heritage. And ideally, we get situations where the military or civil defense or the fire department can work better with cultural professionals to understand how to save their collections and disasters. The research, um, we, track a lot, we track a lot of data on damage to cultural heritage in all types of disasters, both human caused and natural caused disasters. And sometimes that results in um, products that we can actually use operationally to try to um, help and prevent damage. So we were able to use some of the data we'd collected over the years on um, where cultural sites were in um, Iraq and Syria and what ones were damaged and pre present some information to the coalition, to the allies as they were preparing to go take Mosul and parts of Nineveh province back from ISIS, we were able to provide them with information to remind them of how sensitive these areas are, especially places that are already damaged by ISIS. Now it's our turn that we have to take, when, as the coalition comes into, um, into these areas, they have to be very careful to try to protect these sites. Um, we also did one for Raqqa um, during the retaking of uh, Raqqa from ISIS. Lots of training. Um, this is a, just one example of a um, heritage and emergency uh, response training that we do. We call it HEART, and this is one we did in Puerto Rico. Um, so projects in Iraq. I'm going to just give you a short overview. Um, we've been, and I say we, I'm going to say the royal we. I worked in Iraq in 2003 and 2004 as a soldier, as part of the coalition. I worked in the sort of occupation government ministry of culture. So trying to help the Iraqis with stabilization, understanding what objects, uh, inventories to understand what objects had been lost from the Iraq National Museum, but et cetera. And I worked there through 2004, but I didn't return to Iraq until much later on when I started to work with the Iraqi Institute. And Jesse will tell you more about that. But we were really fortunate that Jesse put in the, the time 
and effort in her time away from Smithsonian, building those relationships with Iraqi colleagues and, and her work there because that enabled us to do the project that I want to talk to you about now, which just started in the fall of 2018, and it's called Mosul Museum Project Zero, which seems a little bit odd, but the idea was as we build this group of colleagues from the Mosul Museum itself, from the Smithsonian, and from the Louvre, that we couldn't just go in and start to salvage. We had to really carefully document the museum and the collections and the site as a whole as we found it when once we were able to go there. And we treated it like a cold, um, like a cold case crime scene. And so, um, and I want to acknowledge that we got support from Alif, which is an, a fairly new NGO dedicated to um, doing disaster response in armed conflict situations. Um, so here's the Mosul Museum. As you might remember, it was occupied by ISIS and heavily damaged. They smashed collections with sledgehammers. They um, did a lot of damage to the exterior of the building, and they actually used explosives inside the building. So they had a fantastic um, Assyrian hall of pieces mainly from uh, Nimrud and from Nineveh, and they had um, just uh, this lovely hall from Hatra. As you'll recall, um, many, many uh, provincial museum collections, including the Mosul Museum, sent their movable collections objects to the National Museum in Baghdad for safekeeping. Um, and the same was true for the Mosul Museum. But many objects, as you can see here, the cases are empty, but the objects that are in place are either um, semi-permanently installed into the walls in situ or just too large to move at that time. And so they remained in the museum and were there when ISIS took control of the museum. So there are a couple of other galleries. There's an, an Islamic hall, and um, there's an ancient hall, a, a gallery. And then they had a really wonderful library collection, a lot of volumes about excavation, about archaeology, and records. And so the problem was ISIS occupied the space. They did a lot of damage. They put out videos of that. I don't, I don't really particularly like to show those videos. Um, I don't want to. Um, give uh, any positive reinforcement to that kind of behavior or to the fact that they use them online in order to really hurt people and their identities and try to replace other people's belief systems and um, cultural heritage with their own ideals. So, um, but this is what it looked like before. Here's the Islamic gallery before. You can see, notice these. Um, Notice these uh, tombstones, Islamic um, gravestones on the walls. And there's, the, there's basically the action that they took throughout. And they also, as I mentioned, used explosives. So here's that Assyrian gallery. Um, they put explosives under, I'm trying to remember what that is here, under the throne dais here, which is from Nimrud. And they packed so many explosives under there that they blew a hole in the floor down into the basement area. Here you see these friezes, and you can see the um, explosive marks on the wall and all this debris that they had to deal with. You see the, the Lamassu sculpture, and here there they were blown completely off the wall and then sledgehammered into smaller pieces. So... This is what our Iraqi colleagues have been trying to deal with and protect in the midst of a conflict. So as, you know, as ISIS was hanging on in those last days in western Mosul, they finally fled and set fire to the library and destroyed all the volumes. There was nothing recoverable from this, or at least as far as we know. There may have been something stolen and then the fire set. So what do you do when you confronted with an overwhelming situation like this and you think, well, this is a war crime, so we want to be sure to carefully document this before we start to help with the salvage and recovery. And we do have a really, um, really uh, good 
methodology for doing that kind of salvage, it's very akin to archaeology. You make a grid and you label the tiny pieces and you take lots of photos and you keep track of things. But what about the, we, we wanted to know what about the damage done to the collections? What did that? What types of explosives can make a hole the size of a Volkswagen in the, in the floor and, th and things like that? What should we be looking for? None of us are law enforcement people. So who do you ask? You ask the FBI. And so we did a training of a couple of days with the FBI art crime team in Philadelphia and their evidence team. And here's our fantastic um, photographer. I'll, I'll reveal um, that. Um, Jesse can reveal his identity later. But, um, and so they taught us more methodology. We knew how to do the objects documentation methodology, but they taught us how to think bigger and look for criminal activity. And so we took entry photos. Um, we took overall photos everywhere along the way. Okay, now you know it's Sebastian Meyer. Um, he's kind of famous in, in Iraq for starting the first Iraq um, photo agency there. So um, we were very lucky to have him be our photographer. And we had to think of a method that we would use to make sure that we could do all this in a, an environment where we had to have to travel with armed security, private security and everything. And who they don't want you hanging around there for longer than you have to. So um, here you see the Lamassu figures. They were not only blown off the wall, but hit with sledgehammers. And then um, someone used drills to actually deface the sculpture. And oh, I should have said that the, the, the reason I took this photo is because these were kind of in danger because the floor was weakened and it was literally sloping toward the hole and you, we had these very heavy sculpture that were actually leaning out over the hole. So we wanted to figure out, so we, we've done the shoring to that and made everything safe now and we were no longer in danger of sliding Lamassu. Um, this is Dr. Richard Heron, who um, is the overall founder and executive um, manager of the SCRI, and some of our Iraqi colleagues touring us around and looking through, uh, working very closely with our Iraqi colleagues to understand what their version of, okay, here's what we think happened, here's what seems to be missing, we can't find any fragments of these particular pieces, even though they're missing from the walls. And you see here, um, these where those uh, gravestones were, all those are empty niches now, and there's no evidence of the fragments. Um, and so this is how we did the marking. These are um, fragments of um, uh, mortar shells that came through the roof during the, the battle for, um, for Mosul. And just other unidentified pieces that you need to track as evidence in case it's important later on because we may not know but experts looking at this evidence later on might understand what it is and so they've done a tremendous job salvaging all of the pieces that you saw and storing them very meticulously we have over 4,500 photos of the interior of the building before we even started to pick up one piece and then they've meticulously photographed each piece and we did our preliminary report, which we gave to the Iraq Ministry of Culture in May of last year. We're working on a more detailed report that will include more of the evidence that we found of the criminal activity that happened there, the war crimes against the Mosul Museum. So that's all I have for you. And Jesse will come up and tell you more about the overall Iraq program. So I'm going to focus in on um, the work that we're doing at Nimruz. And um, also let me thank um, uh, Sean and Ann and Frank for in inviting me to come and speak about our work because clearly you have to have a lot of passion to, to send yourself on, off to Iraq regularly. And so um, I'm here representing a lot of people who have a lot of passion 
Um, you'll see some of their pictures in a minute. But I want to particularly point out this guy. Uh, his name is Dave Gosby. He's both the head of the Postal Museum, and he's also the head of what we call the New New Directions team. And he was also one of my first students when I went over to Iraq in 2009. So through the work that I've been doing there over the last decade, I've been able to see how that dedication and the support we've gotten from so many people, so many institutions over so many years is directly leading into the recovery at both the Mosul Museum and at, uh, at Nimrud. So I'm gonna talk today about the Nimrud, what we call the Nimrud Rescue Project. Um, here's the slide that shows many of the people we're working with. So here's Zaid again and his colleague Saad. Um, the, he's the conservator now for the museum and um, Zaid is the director of the museum. And this is a picture taken at Nimrud in 2009 when they were going out and doing some basic stabilization and, and documentation. So they're our leads in Iraq. We also have Brian Leone who I've worked with in Iraq since 2009. Um, Corey, of course, Catherine Hansen, who you saw before, and another important partner for our project is Kent Severson, who's supported by the Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture, and Design. And all along, as we're talking about this, you'll see that what we're trying to do for different projects is build different teams of, of uh, support and different people so that um, as we continue our work, we're able to... Um, um, adapt as needed for the particu particularities of what goes on in Iraq, because if nothing else, you have to be flexible to work in these kind of places. So Nimrud um, is located in the northern part of Iraq. Here's, here's Mosul, where the Mosul Museum is. Nimrud is a little bit to the south, and I'm also going to be talking about a town called Erbil, which is um, located in the Kurdistan Autonomous Region. But all of our work takes place here in the northern part of the country. And um, Nimrud, which was, is also in the, in the Bible known as Kala, was once the capital of a Neo-Assyrian empire that stretched from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. At its height in 800 BC, the city walls encircled 360 hectares and included temples, palaces, monumental buildings, and, and a ziggurat. Ziggurat. There are a lot of excavations that have taken place um, beginning in the 1800s. That's why the Bowdoin Museum has um, the uh, sculptures that you've got on display. These came um, through excavations that took place over many, many years um, by many different people. But um, uh, a number of these sculptures, and these are spread all over the world. So some of them are in, um, uh, at the Met in New York. Some of them are in uh, London. Um, but a number of these pieces remained in, in Iraq, and uh, beginning in the 1950s, the Iraqis um, rebuilt um, and stabilized the archi architectural remains of, of several of the Northwest Palace where these are found, as well as other temples around the site. And this was an archaeological park, a tourist destination um, for many years. So when you look at, um, at this slide, this is the reconstructed part. They reconstructed the, these walls and then set the ancient sculptures up against the walls. But these are actually um, stone and reinforced concrete um, walls that have been put up to protect the stone sculptures. There are two main kinds of sculptures that were found at the site, the Lamassu that Corey keeps talking about. Um, Lamassu are human-headed bull or lion figures, and they were flanking the entrances into the Northwest Palace. And then many of these low relief sculptures, one, two, two or three that you have here at Bowdoin that are depicting uh, neo-Assyrian military victories, royal decrees, religious practices, and daily court life. This palace was designed to symbolize the power of Ashur Nasser Paul II. So in March of 2015, um, the, um, and as documented in these videos that ISIS put out, the Northwest Palace was destroyed um, by first by jackhammers and sledgehammers and earth moving equipment. And then they put these barrels filled with explosives and detonated the barrels. I want you to remember this image because you're gonna see this later. They've basically broken off the sculptures at the front of the, of the palace and they've pushed them into what we're calling the, the push pile in front of the palace. So this is a view to the south, looking south. 
and that's a view looking north of the same explosion, just showing you from two different directions. So again, this is before a view of the Northwest Palace from the top, top of the ziggurat, which was a, basically a, a mud brick pyramid. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And you can see here, this was the entrance into the Northwest Palace. Note particularly this Western gate, but all of this was part of the reconstructed building. Some of it covered where these sculptures had been located. Um, some of it just the, the walls reconstructed and the rooms open to the, um, open to the air. And then here's the same image after the, the construction and here's the only standing um, gate, the Western gate. So a few befores and afters. This was the ziggurat um, and the Ishtar temple. These structures are located on the northwest corner of the citadel and when they were excavated uh, by Max Malawan, who also happens to be the husband of Agatha Christie, um, it was approximately 43 meters high. Um, I don't know how much it had, it had um, uh, eroded by the time this picture was taken. And it was built of mud brick with a stone base along the bottom. ISIS used um, earth moving equipment and flattened it um, and then they mined it. And then the mines were um, uh, taken out by uh, Iraqi military and they also used more earth moving equipment to ensure that all of the mines were removed. This is the Ishtar temple here. The Ishtar temple was um, dedicated to the goddess of love and war. This is the Nabu temple here before and take notice of these two sculptures because you'll see them again. They're standing in front of the fish gate. They were merman, merman that um, guarded the entrance to the temple, which was known, um, which was dedicated to the God of wisdom, scribes and writing. And then here, this is after the work of ISIS. Now I'm gonna show a little video um, that talks about our work and what we're doing there. What happened at Nimrud? That's a, a horrific story. This was a, an ancient site that had beautiful stone sculptures that had been on display for many, many years. The Nimrud site was one of many in and around Mosul that was occupied and then publicly destroyed by ISIS. So Project Nimrud is a Nimrud rescue project, and we're working with Iraqi colleagues at the Iraqi Institute for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage who are responsible for picking up the pieces at Nimrud. The role of the Smithsonian and the Museum Conservation Institute is to work with the Nimrud Rescue Project through the Iraqi Institute to help the Iraqis recover their own cultural heritage. In the year 2017, the Smithsonian الاتفاقية وعقدت بعقد اتفاقية مع الجانب العراقي المتمثل بالهيئة العامة لآثار والتراث على تبني مشروع إنقاذ النمرود وكان هذا هذه الاتفاقية تمكنت عن تشكيل فريق عن طريق تدريب كادر من الأثاريين في في دائرة الآثار في موصل وتم تشكيل هذا الفريق على مستوى عالي وتلقيه التدريب الكامل والمهارات والتقنيات حول كيفية إنقاذ موقع النمرود وعملية انتشار القطعة الأثرية من داخل الموقع المتفجر والمحطم. The Nimrud Rescue Project is somewhat unique in that the skills that we're building with the team are direct technical skills. How you pick up a piece of something that's been damaged, how you document that, how you store that. But beyond that, we're also building problem-solving skills, looking at the site of Nimrud. There has never been damage of a site like this anywhere. كثير من المواقع الأثرية موجودة وهي ذات أهمية كبيرة، لكن نمرود تتميز بأهمية أكبر كون في السنوات الماضية عندما كان هناك أعمال التنقيب والعثور على كنز نمرود الذي أصبح. 
وكل المكتشفات العالمية التي ظهرت من حيث كنوزها وعندما يقوم داعش في تدمير هذا الموقع كونها مهمة جدا لذلك لا بد علينا استرجاع هذا الموقع وصيانته وتأجيله لكي يكون يعني حاضرا لمن يريد أن يزور الموقع. So this project's been going on for about 18 months, and we already have the storage facility built. The crew is ready to go out and begin picking up the pieces. Uh, we have just a few more days of, of practice here this time, and then they're going to go out and start actually recovering the pieces, getting them in storage, and covering everything up so we know that things will be safe for years until all of the work can be finished. <laughs> So when we lose these kinds of cultural heritage, we lose something of our understanding of each other. We lose something that tells us how all of us are similar across the world. Having cultural heritage like this preserved it's different ways of understanding how we as people across the world all have a lot in common. So a key piece of every project that is run at the Nuclear Market Institute, be it by the Smithsonian or other partners, is this idea of skills development for our Iraqi heritage colleagues that is done in a sustainable way. But this needs to be something that can be built upon in the future. So we're not teaching just one specific skill set that can't be changed or adapted over time. And so we're looking at this in, in an eye towards sustainability of the Institute and of the role that the Institute will continue to play in Iraq in educating heritage specialists in the future. We're not just an international mission coming in for a week or two to bestow some short-term positive press on something. We're here for the long term to make sure that the Iraqis have everything they need to do the project and to continue things on in the future. So the Smithsonian's well placed to do this work because a very international institution with cultural heritage and scientific knowledge at its core. Conservation has both those things. It's using scientific knowledge to, to conserve, to save cultural heritage. It's combining this knowledge of both the cultural heritage and the science and modern understanding of deterioration so that things are kept safe. While many people think the Smithsonian maybe primarily is a museum complex, it is in fact the largest research complex in the world. And so we can bring expertise in object conservation, art conservation, architectural conservation, archaeological site management, and anything else to bear in Iraq and focus on these complex, multifaceted challenges like the community in the project. So having the ability to pull from different parts of the Smithsonian and partner with those different organizations and units within one Smithsonian means that we can bring the expertise together quickly, move fast to make sure that we're providing support on site in a way that helps our Iraqi partners. We're forging relationships between the Americans and Iraqis that will transcend this one project. Our goal is to make the Iraqi Institute sustainable for the long term, so Iraq has a model for cultural heritage preservation around the region. Okay, so that was all the hard part. Now it gets better from there. Um, well, this is the this is a picture of the Iraqi Institute, and this is why I, this. When I first went to Iraq in 2009, I went for about 18 months to teach conservation to some Iraqis. 
but through the generosity of the Kurdistan regional government, they donated this building and renovated this building. And so we then had a facility where we could bring people from around the country to learn about cultural heritage preservation. Um, we do this through not just our programs, but um, anyone who has an interest in teaching cultural heritage conservation can come in and work with the, the now director, Dr. Abdullah Korshid, to um, do courses in archeological excavation or um, manuscript conservation. So there have been a wide range of courses that have been taught at, at the Iraqi Institute. Um, all of the work that goes on there is about capacity building for people who are actually doing this work with cultural heritage. They may be government workers, they may be people who represent their communities, uh, they may be clerics who are, are dealing with um, uh, uh, response to ISIS, um, but basically we're working locally to build their capacity and make sure they have the tools they need to recover and save their um, their materials. It's not us coming in to do the work. And just a couple more views. So um, people come together from all over Iraq. We've had about over 500 students now through the Institute from all 18 provinces since 2010. And here, beyond what they do in the classroom, they spend time together. They are all living together. They're eating together and developing this cadre of cultural heritage professionals that are working in museums, antiquities departments, and universities all across the country. So the students that come are Arab, Su Shia, and Sunni. They're Kurd, they're Yazidi, they're Christian, they're male and female. And they all come together in this space because of their deep concern for cultural heritage. All of the work that we've done there from the beginning um, is in three main areas, collections, care, and conservation, archeological site preservation, and architect architectural site conservation. And if you're interested in learning more about the Meraki Institute, I have brochures here that I'm glad to um, share with you that give you more of the history of, of what's gone on there. But of course, disaster recovery, because we've been working in Iraq, has been a major component of all the training that we do. And since 2016, the Smithsonian's taken the lead on all the US-based training at the Iraqi Institute. Um, beyond this work we're talking about with the Mosul Museum and with Nimrud, we also do courses we call Fundamentals in Heritage Conservation, where we're giving the basic background in how do you care for cultural heritage, um, whether you're working in a museum or you're taking care of your, um, your community's library or, or um, any of these things. But now back to Nimrud. Um, based out of the um, Institute, we've carried out a series of mission, uh, missions where we've trained the heritage pro professionals who have the legal authority, and that's, the, that's an important thing to say. These are people who have legal authority under the laws of Iraq to take care of Nimrud, in all of the and we're training them in all of the skills they need to work at, at, um, at the site. So here what they're doing, they're, we're actually in Arabil, in a, just a, a field that's near the apartment where we live, where people have been dumping um, construction trash, so large pieces of concrete. And that's where we did our practice before they went out and um, started doing the work at Nimrud. We've had special training on, beyond the uh, first aid training that Corey talked about with the grid system, we've done spe special training on lifting large sculpture, of course, and uh, working with Zay, the team leader, they, we've adapted this training so his crew, which now numbers about 24 people, has all the training that they need so they can go out and actually do the, the, uh, all the work on the site. So we, meaning the Americans, first went to uh, Nimrud in September 2018. And when we first got to the site, this was our first time seeing it in real life, it became clear that there are decades of work to do. And the most urgent problem is that this stone here, the, this is that pile I told you to keep your mind on when you saw the bulldozer. Um, this um, is a stone called, it's called Mosul marble, but it's not actually a marble. It's something called an amorphous gypsum, and it's slightly soluble in water, especially if you have running water, like water running off a roof. So sitting out in, in the open air like this, slowly it was going to erode away. So in, in addition to figuring out what we we're gonna do with the pieces we could pick up, we needed to come up with a strategy for how we were gonna protect the, the large stones in place. 
this is just a couple of photos to give a sense of the size of the recovery area. This is actually behind that standing gate that you saw, and these are collapsed walls, pieces of sculpture sticking up um, from, the, from the dirt, and then small pathways where you can get through. This is the citadel, so the major walled area of the site. This is the Northwest Tower. So there's huge areas of, of uh, huge areas that we're having to deal with. Oh, and the next the next shot. This is uh, this is a piece of sculpture still in situ, just like you've got in Bowdoin College with cuneiform writing. But you see, there's still lots and lots of detail preserved on on these broken pieces. So after visiting the site in person, Kent Severson, who I pointed out at the beginning, um, our partner from Shangri La, he recommended that we develop a methodology of covering up the large fragments. So we use geotextile, and then we use these um, mud bricks, mud brick, modern mud brick or dirt, to hold the geotextile in place. And we know that the sculptures are safe this way because they they um, were preserved for for um, millennia underground. So we know as long as they're protected under soil, they're going to not erode the way they would if they're standing above ground. And this is um, these are practice covering sessions that we did at the Iraqi Institute. The other thing, the um, geotextile protects things from abrasion, but it's also a marker. So when, when the crew goes back in the future, it's it's easily it's very easy to figure out where the stones um, that they covered up are before, uh, the where the stones they've covered up are when they go back in. And then um, we've also um, built a um, a new purpose-built storage facility. This is it's only about half finished here, um, and all of the materials that are being recovered from the site are going into this storage facility. Here's a picture of one of our team members. Um, she's working on site. So she's um, uh, documenting all the things that have been picked up from this square, and then they're preparing to go into this square. So they're both picking up fragments of the sculpture, but then going through and cleaning up and making sure that the area, uh, the areas that they've worked on are, are cleared away so that they can go in, we can go in with um, larger equipment and deal with some of the other areas of the site. So this is the team on the first day of recovery, and, my, and Kent and Brian were out on site. Kent is actually holding the first piece that they picked up. Um, this is in 2018. And by the end of the first season, they were bringing large fragments into the, into the storage, um, uh, covering and documenting everything that they were doing. And this is that push pile again. They were stabilizing the push pile, covered it with, built a retaining wall, put a covering over it, and then here they're um, pulling um, a tarp uh, provided by UNESCO over the whole push pile. So that's now safe and protected until we can get um, the planning together and the decision making about how much reconstruction will go on in the, on in the future. Uh, we put this picture in here because December 10th was the anniversary of pushi pushing ISIS out of Mosul. And these guys, it was a, it was a national holiday. These guys didn't take the holiday. They went to work and uh, to show how important it was that they um, recover um, from the damage wrought by ISIS. But they did have a, um, a party and had cake out on the site. So it shows the dedication of these guys, even though it was you know, equivalent to President's Day here, they went out and, and continued work. So they've also finished a second season, Nimrud, um, Nimrud Rescue, excuse me, season two, which was from October 2019 through January 2020. And these images um, show uh, where they've been working. So here's the palace. They've cleared all of these areas in front and then covered these red dots are all of the larger sculptures that um, they've covered up. This is now going to allow them to bring in um, heavier, bigger equipment to lift away the concrete roofs um, get um, larger pieces of sculpture out that have been found. They also began recovery of things that were actually blown off the citadel. They were blown up and out by the force of the explosion. So they're um, getting under this fence um, put in place by UNESCO and bringing up, walking down the sides of the hill to pick up the fragments that are down the hill and then bringing them back into storage. Another, a lot of other fragments have been covered with geotextile and either tarps or mud brick or soil. 
And then remember the merman statues I pointed out at the beginning. They're now, they've been brought back and they're now in storage at the site. These, these slides show removal of the storage building. It's an old storage building that was built next to the Northwest Palace. It was destroyed also by, um, by ISIS and removing the remains is again gonna allow them better access into the areas of the palace that, that have to be addressed. So by the end of season two, the crew had recovered um, 5,202 fragments from 8,900 square meters. The efforts filled up 219 crates and 19 pallets in storage. And then they've also covered 33 large fragments in the field with geotextile and mud bricks, plus that mud, that Lamassi pile. So I used to um, end this talk talking about the fact that we were kind of stuck after this, that um, we still had to deal with the fact that there might be what's called ERW, explosive remains of war, either left in place by ISIS or um, things that did not explode when they did the destruction of the site in, inside the Northwest Palace. Luckily, in the last few weeks, thanks to our friends at the State Department, we're now working with a company to survey and identify any ERW that might be left. As of now, none's been found, but they, they will be doing the intensive survey um, starting, starting in a week or two. So they're working very uh, closely with our Iraqi team to ensure nobody's, um, nobody and also everything, the sculptures stay safe. We also have to make decisions about this one remaining complete panel, which is being referred to as the survivor of Nimrud. So there's lots of work for us and of course our Iraqi colleagues for many years to come. And just the, to show the logos of many of the people, many of the groups that are working together on this project, um, and um, uh, support everything that we're doing at Nimrud. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse and Corey, uh, for that wonderful talk, um, for sharing with us the uh, incredibly important and, and exciting work you're doing in collaboration with your colleagues in Iraq. Um, I've enjoyed learning from you this entire visit and, and more tonight. Um, I wanna turn the floor over in a minute to questions from the audience, um, but I thought I would get the ball rolling uh, by asking if you would share with us a little bit about the personal motivations that bring you to do uh, cultural heritage work, especially in the face of really significant challenges, uh, working in um, a region that is, is changing all the time, that has suffered generations of, um, of um, lack of access to training, uh, that you're, you're, you're working against. Um, both of you referred, Corey, you began your talk um, by mentioning you know, feeling a higher calling And uh, Jesse, you spoke about the passion, that the great amount of passion that's required to stay invested and to keep going through Iraq um, year after year. Um, so I wonder if you could share with us the moment that you realized cultural, you wanted to dedicate your careers to cultural heritage and what keeps you invested in, in this field? Uh, I'll say just really quickly that, you know, the, it, it, for me, it comes in no small part from the experience of 2003 and being sent to assist in a in a such a drastic disaster that happened to such a major museum, and as a museum professional myself, thinking how how could this happen, and how can I help make sure it never happens again? And then, as you're working with people, you you become really motivated by the fact that they didn't let that stop them from trying to save their heritage. Yeah, I'd say it's something very similar for me. Much of what I'm, I am doing is uh, more teaching, less practical on the ground stuff. And every time we have a group together, there's a point when you realize that 
there's somebody from the south of Iraq talking with somebody who's from the north of Iraq. And if we weren't doing this kind of training and education that we do at the Iraqi Institute where we're bringing people together from all over the country, um, these people might never get to meet each other. So we're, we're doing more than just teaching them how to save cultural heritage. We're giving them op opportunities that allow them to um, see their world in a different way, know more about the, the other people that live in their country, and, um, uh, and have opportunities that they might not, not otherwise have. So what you hear, what you don't hear from either of us is we really believe in the cultural heritage of Iraq. What we really believe in is the people who care so much, whether it's in Iraq or any other country, about helping them however we can to, to save their heritage. You made a distinction between conservation and preservation. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's a very complicated question. Um, usually, and this varies across the world, so the definitions I'm going to give you are more what are used in America, uh, Europe, and other parts of the world use these same terms differently. The Arabic words for conservation and preservation are different depending on the country, Arab-speaking country you come from. But in general, preservation means um, stopping anything from happening. You're trying to stop damage from occurring. Conservation is more figuring out to improve it after the damage has happened in a very general way. Thank you both for an extremely um, stimulating um, presentation. There's so much to think about. And one of the things that came to my mind as I was looking at your slides is that while Nobody would desire uh, wide-scale destruction of the sort that we have witnessed at the site of Nimrud. Um, nonetheless, it's happened. And I was curious to know whether, um, as a result of that damage, there were any new insights that are available now to scholars, be it about materiality, be it about, I don't know, the backs of things that are now being exposed or the bases that might not otherwise have come to light if things had not been um, pulled apart in the way they were under ISIS. Thank you. Well, ISIS discovered another sculpture. They just didn't realize they had discovered it. I didn't show that slide, but they actually used earth-moving equipment near that Ishtar temple, and they came within a quarter inch of, of uncovering a, a, a sculpture that had never been seen before. Um, and that's now been covered up with a geotextile. So that's you know one very specific thing. We, we know our crew is doing documentation of everything that is going in, um, and so it could be through analysis of photography. Later, different kinds of information may come to light, but at this point it's too early in, in, to know how beyond uh, documenting what happened this, this work may be useful. And if I could just add to that, so Jesse's, you know, the conservation science person from from the aspect of doing disaster response this idea of um, doing it in a more crime scene forensic way um, as far as we know really hasn't been done before so it it pushed us all to get better at, at that disaster response and how we deal with that so that we can make sure that the that information is available to Iraqis should they decide to pursue a war crimes tribunal situation. And other war crimes situations in the past, we haven't always been able, and I'd like us to get a lot better and faster at it than we are now. Thank you so much for doing a courageous and extraordinary work. I think that what we are viewing through your presentation is an incredible damage and rage. Why did ISIS do this? And then secondly, um, is there any uh, effort for security now so that this does not happen again? <laughs> well, 
from, there's a lot of analysis and discussion and uh, academic work that is going on and um, to try to figure out why ISIS did this. And I don't think it's completely known. In our two cases though, um, I think we're feeling more and more that the destruction that they did was actually to hide things that they stole. So they made these big performative videos that made everybody you know, see the tragedy and how strong they were, scared everyone. But in fact, it was just to hide the fact that they were taking out a lot of this stuff to sell it. But we're, we're still in the data collection um, to know how, exactly how much of, of both these places was taken away and might actually um, be hidden in Hong Kong or in Turkey for, for going on the market somewhere else. Does that answer your question? Well, I can speak to Nimrud specifically. At Nimrud, UNESCO paid for um, paid for a, a fence around the whole site, and there there are police on the site um, all the time now. And we're working to develop uh, security surveys there, and we'll be doing the same thing as things go further at the the Mosul Museum. Um, but all of these are dependent on long-term funding and the um, ability of the Iraqis to manage this long term and you know those are things that we don't we don't have any control of we'll do what we can as long as we're involved in the project um, but it all comes down to like any 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 project the maintenance and the desire that goes on longer term and I'd just like to add that I mean the the capability of ISIS to do these intentional destructions was not a lack of security per se, like we would think of it if your museum got robbed in Washington DC or something, it was really the front of an armed conflict between armed non-state actors and the, the Iraq government um, forces. And so there's very little that your average cultural professional can do in that situation. And, and, and sometimes you just have to wait until that battlefront passes or you know, things change hands again, and only then can you work with your colleagues to try to do the recovery. So it's not for lack of trying, it's just, you know, in an armed conflict, sometimes you lose. Uh, <clears throat> my question goes to the, also the research library. Um, it wasn't some of that recoverable though? I mean, you know, research has been going on there for literally decades and decades and decades. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, you know, if those reports aren't in Germany, you know, Great Britain and other places mm -hmm. where, you know, the scholars over time have been able to really file other copies of it. I also know that they executed many of the scholars that uh, were involved with some of those sites. And that's been reported, which um, I think, again, is a great tragedy. But do you have any idea of the, the number of people that are still there that have familiarity with the collection? And uh, also, has there been great success in recovery of the things from the Mosul Museum? I know they're still appearing in markets around the world, but um, and I know the federal government is working hard to try and bring some of that material back. But is there any estimate yet on how successful they've been in that regard? Well, y yes, you're right for the library. If these were publications, things that were published, they would exist. Um, and we haven't done any collection, tried to understand how much of this was unpublished reports that perhaps the Iraqi archaeologists put together. But, you know, it, all of that now has to be recollected and pulled together so it's available for the, the Mosul archaeological and student community. So um, we do know they were able to recover a lot of maps that were in a different part of the museum. That's one part of their archive that was recovered. Um, specifically at the Mosul Museum, no, as far as I know, uh, nothing has gone on to the market yet. The expectation is that it's, it's sitting in warehouses for a while and 10, 20, 30 years from now, it may start coming on to the market. There have been things that have been found coming out of the um, Iraqi Museum from 2002. Um, uh, some of those things have come onto the market and been seized, but um, to my knowledge, nothing from the Mosul Museum has yet been, been seized. And I would add that after the liberation of Mosul, 
a lot of objects have been recovered that were being kept in various ISIS houses and things like that. Not so much from the Mosul Museum, that, that was very clear, but things that have been illegally excavated in places because as we know, ISIS was sort of um, um, selling the rights to um, dig up ar archeological sites and things like that. So the um, Mosul Museum staff are safekeeping those items that have been found um, around the city. But yeah, it's, there's a disturbing lack of things directly from the museum being recovered. the impossible question of of how much heartache and how much hope is there because your story is very much a lot of heartache and a lot of hope and if you could pick on any given day how does that break down for you and then the second question would be um, is there uh, residual animosity towards the United States that you'd like to see removed and is it in your story obviously it's not responsible for ISIS but Sure, there is residual animosity here and there, but we don't really get it personally because we have such good working relationships with our colleagues. Um, we're, we're also working with um, more Western-leaning educated people as well. So, so communities who may have more animosity are not people we normally um, see in those kinds of settings. And I'll say 90% um, hope and 10% heartbreak. Yeah, it seems, you know, from Americans, it seems hopeless when you see these kinds of things. These guys have been going through it for decades, you know, generations even. They get up every, every day and continue to work. And so if they can do it, you know, what is it for me to get on a plane to go over and help them? So that's, that's what keeps me going. It's just how dedicated and how positive they are, um, how important it is for their children and, and um, um, bringing everything back so that they, they have opportunity going forward. Could you address briefly um, how you uh, find and identify a new site or a new country and how you approach the, that country? Who do you talk to? How do you get in there in the first place? And then finally, uh, why or why not will you not be working in a first world site? such as uh, uh, in France for the uh, cathedral? Um, so we, generally speaking, go to places that lack the capacity to be able to do the response themselves. So France has plenty of conservators, plenty of expertise. I don't think they'd welcome Americans coming in trying to tell them how to conserve the, that site, um, the Notre Dame. Um, and we go to places where we are invited so, and the Smithsonian has really good relationships with countries around the world. We work with our Department of State through the embassies. And so usually we, we get an invite to ask if we can possibly come do a training or even help with the, with the um, rescue effort. Iraqis will be in charge, it's their stuff. What, what we'll do, and the, the French are also doing this with the Mosul Museum, is bringing the expertise to train them and help bring up questions of where do you start and which ones should you restore and are we gonna try to restore all of them or are we gonna spend our time doing one to a very high level? Um, these are questions you have when you start reconstruction of, of anything, even even things that we work on at the Smithsonian. But it's, it's their, it's their material culture, they're responsible. So it's, it's us continuing the conversation so that we can support them, um, whether it's through um, uh, more
more training or more opportunities or more equipment or whatever it might be so that they can do what they, they want to do then. I think I can hold myself to it. I think it's really what it is is you do less and you have more time to play and discover and learn. Is that what it is? Or am I just oh, um, it? No, it, it, it'll be these guys or their kids, yeah, because <laughs> it, it's going to take a long time. But yeah, these um, one of the people I pointed out at the beginning, Saad, um, he is the head of conservation for the Mosa Museum and the head um, for the um, uh, the Numid Rescue Project as well. So he's in charge of the teams that will be working on that. And he uh, he's had training by me and others. He's gone to the British Museum for training. There's a, a French uh, conservator who's going to go out and help them um, to begin some of these very large sculptures. So um, so he he'll be in charge of whatever team we put together to do the work. <laughs> no, I mean, I've explained it before as I'm not really a woman in that situation. I'm an American who's been, who's there to help. And so I'm allowed to do things that other Iraqi women might not. But there is a, vi in Iraq in particular, there's a very educated um, uh, class there and a lot of very scholarly women. So it's not, it's not rare for people, for 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 women to have um, a lot of status in that kind of situation. The director of the Iraq National Museum in Baghdad is a woman. Yeah. And uh, so it's, yeah. Um, bu building on um, Susan Wagner's question, I wondered if you could speak a little bit um, to the significance of your military training. We've been speaking about your cultural heritage training, but could you speak a little bit to the fact that you've been were trained um, in the U.S. Army and what and kind of what you thought of your Iraq days as being a more, that how that affects your day-to-day -day approach to problem solving, team building, um, and perhaps other factors as well. Thanks. Well, when Jesse tells us what to do, we all do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing is leadership and teamwork and understanding. Um, I think from my perspective, the, my my military background more informs the way that, which I didn't really get to talk about tonight, but the way I do a lot of teaching for the military on why cultural heritage matters, things like that Mosul Guide. You know, we're constantly working on reminding the, the next generation of soldiers what their responsibilities are under international humanitarian law. Um, as far as working with the Iraqis, the, it's, you know, I've had a few chances to remind them that it's also their responsibility to teach their own military and that they need to have protective measures and things um, where they can help their own militaries understand because they might be involved in fighting that could damage fights as well. Yeah. And I, though I was in the Army Reserves, I don't really count it because I was in the band. And... <laughs> And so <laughs> say it counts. Yeah. <laughs> but it did give me an insight into how the military works, which has allowed me to appreciate and also see and support what Corey does through her much deeper experience. Um, so it's given me a little insight into how into how that works when I'm trying to interface with, with those guys. Uh, as the moderator, I, I think it's okay if I take the prerogative of asking the last question to, to close our discussion. And I wonder if you might uh, uh, share your thoughts on what is the role and responsibility of uh, cultural institutions like the Bowdoin College Museum of Art as stewards of uh, Syrian cultural heritage like our Syrian Muse? What can we do um, as cultural institutions? What can our museum goers, our students, our faculty, and our community at large, what can we do to support the work that you're doing in Iraq? I'll let Jesse have the last word. I'll just say that I, I think you're kind of you're 
doing it here at Bowdoin by engaging the Iraqi community that's here in the United States and using that material to teach your students about the culture where those um, fantastic objects comes from and why it's so important to have that global view of, of what people value and understanding their own heritage in a different way because you can understand how people internationally value their heritage. So, and I wanna see you know, a new generation of cultural heritage professionals coming out of institutions that don't just think about their own research, but think about how they can leave the world a better place than they found it by helping, helping other professionals save their own heritage. Yeah, when I started this work, I had brown hair, and we need some younger people to come in and, and help. <laughs> but, but I would completely echo what, um, what Corey said, that um, um, what I saw in the exhibit today was um, an attempt to show not just why this is important in the past, but why this material is important for now and what it says about our world now. And I think the more you can do to, to get those ideas across about not Iraq being a big scary place full of terrorists, but in fact full of full of really um, special people, then you're doing a lot in a really good way. And so. Well, I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight and I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Corey Wegner and Jesse Johnson for speaking with us.